uh, I hope you had a good lunch. And now, <laughs> be ready for Slava Mirginter. Yeah, hello. Nice to see you all. Uh, all right, so I'm going to be talking about Git, basically. So how many of you know what it is? OK, almost everybody. Uh, how many of you use Git? Cool. How many of you have never had any problems because of using Git? <laughs> All right, so you're not using, right? <laughs> yeah, thanks. So, similar question. How many of you regard yourselves as developers? Wow. Perfect audience. Uh, so, I'd like to start with this slide that just says that I don't want to be sued by Atlassian if I talk stupid. So let's not focus on this one. Uh, so who am I going to talk about? So I'm going to talk about Atlassian Jira team. Not about the tool, but the team and the processes that we use while developing Atlassian Jira. So Jira is written by 64 developers officially, because this is the number that is in the release notes. But if you count everybody who actually participates in development by producing modules that are used by Jira, it would probably be twice as many, three times as many, so a lot of people. And those people live in three major geographies. So excuse my slang. If you work for corporations, you probably heard about headcounts and geographies. What I mean is that we have three major offices where there is more than 10 people working. And of course, we have many places where freelancers work. So there's one person, two persons working somewhere. They need to communicate with the team, but they are not on the premise. And the three geographies are Sydney, Gdansk, and San Francisco. And each of them is about eight hours apart. By about, I mean that now we have eight hours to Sydney, but in a few months, like when the winter starts, it's going to be 10 hours. So another question, how many, how many of you have worked in such environment where, when you have a big difference in time zones between offices? All right, so the rest of you should be very lucky. <laughs> and uh, how the team is structured? Basically, every release, release is about half a year. Uh, every release, people are assigned to themes. And these are the themes that you know from the Agile books. So a piece of functionality, officially grouped together, given to the team for their responsibility. But there are experts for some old code. For example, there is, let's say, mail handling code that is there for very long. There is only a handful of people who actually know how it works. And also, there is a very new code that only the people who just wrote it know it. So mm, splitting people into teams, themes, I'm sorry, is one thing. Uh, having everybody communicate about what you are going to implement is another. So we are not working in silos. And what, what is a Jira application? Basically, it's 12 years old. And actually, I could just stop the introduction, introduction here because it speaks everything. It's very old code. And of course, being old is not something bad, uh, as long as you can actively develop it still. So to make it possible, we have a core, which is the core functionality, the mm, interfaces for the components. And we have all, all, excuse me, over 150 components that cooperate with, with each other to make one working application. And then we have some add-ons. So we, we can have the base application, we can have uh, Agile added to it, uh, we can have some management add-ons, lots of it, which depend on each other, of course. And all of it is developed by different teams. And the different teams have different roles. So even, for example, so, so simple thing as coding style, whether you put brackets on the same line or the other uh, line, is a source of, well, let's call it politely, fights. And <clears throat> to make it even more complicated, we have two versions, well, not versions, but two aspects of Jira. One is the behind the firewall, so the stuff that you can download. 
and you have multiple versions of it. You have upgrade paths, etc., and you have hosted. And hosted has its own rules. It's, it behaves differently. You have to write it differently. So, have I scared you enough? <laughs> yeah, I guess I, I have bored you enough. But <laughs> uh, one more thing to, to just show how the picture, uh, how, how complicated the picture is. At last, in Jira release cycle. So we have major behind the firewall re releases. So every half a year, more or less, we are doing the big bank release of new features. But then we have minor behind the firewall releases. So maybe every a few weeks, maybe after two days, we have to release new version because we found some security hole or we have found a critical bug that just has to be fixed because otherwise people stop buying our product. And more or less continuously deploying to on demand. You, you may think of on-demand as Facebook, for example. You don't have an instance of Facebook. It's the service that's there in the cloud. You can use it. And it's our job to make sure that you actually can use it. It doesn't break. It has all the security patches applied, etc. So what are the challenges? Oops. Excuse me. We work in two-week uh, two iterations. It's my new remote. I, I'm not sure I can operate it properly. Uh, challenges. The team has grown. So only a few years ago, Jira was developed by 10 people sitting in the same place, talking to each other, uh, going to coffee, going for beer. Communication was easy. You just talked to the person that you wanted to talk, asked him whatever you wanted. You got some easy discussion or you got some uh, decisions that made very quickly. Everything was, uh, was great. But then, uh, the team has grown. So it was no longer Sydney. It, it were different, uh, different offices in different time zones. The communication became a problem. And it wasn't the core that you had to de develop. Now you had to develop all those 150 components in sync. And to make it even more difficult, you didn't have the project management in one place anymore, or even product management. Another question, who of you know what's the difference between project manager and product manager? All right. <laughs> uh, so the, the difference is the project manager is the person who's responsible for moving the product, project further. So responsible for meeting deadlines, setting deadlines. OK, I'm simplifying things. The product manager is responsible for saying where the product is going, so what the feature will be, when, we do, when do we need them, why these features, not other features. OK. But bottom line is you need both to keep your product going in the right direction. So what did we end up with? Uh, with a full dependency graph. So to do anything. However simple, you basically have to contact many people. You have to do your changes in multiple places, in multiple repositories, maybe. And it's no longer one silo when you can check out your code, make your changes, check them in, and hope that everything works. So the more people work on the project, the more busy the repository is. Basically, if 10 people are committing, it's more or less one commit maybe every hour, maybe every 10 minutes, may maybe every day. But it's not parallel. And how, how often may it happen that you do the commit because you think it's OK, it passed tests locally, and you have the integration build that says, well, the test has failed, you broke the build. And the reason is that you didn't know that somebody just changed something else that you depended on. Another question, you all use Git. I'm sure that you have seen this message. What does it mean? It means that I have just created some change. I committed locally. I want to push it to the central repository. And it turns out that somebody else has just done the same. So they changed their code, committed something. And now I have to merge it. And now I have to do my work again. I'm coming from subversion world. In subversion, it meant that I had to commit to the remote repository. I don't have any practical choice. When it failed, I had to merge live changes without actually knowing what it is. 
because I did update, I got some changes from my colleagues, and now I had a problem. How do I merge it? In Git, we are a bit happier because Git, or actually any DVCS, whatever I say about Git, it also practically applies to Mercurial. Uh, we have two stages. When we want to commit our changes, we first commit them locally, and then we have to push them to the remote repository. And there is a similar thing when we are taking the, the changes from repository. First we fetch, so the changes themselves are in local repository that we have on our disk, and then we update. So we can postpone the moment of applying the changes to the code after we know what the changes actually are. So how do we do it? We can check what's actually new. We fetch, and we compare the, our view of master. Master is trunk for subversion. It's the specific branch that everybody agreed is the one. It's the, 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 the top of the repository. So this way I can see what actually changed upstream in the remote repository before I actually say that my changes are done. I can fix them and then commit when I know, when I know that I'm synchronized with, with my colleagues. And the other one, if you use git and don't know these commands, please try to remember them because they are lifesavers. And this one allows me to see what's the difference, what I have changed and what my colleagues have changed which means that I can consciously push to the upstream repository. And I think that almost all of you said that you use Git. So I had a question. Yes, this is the invitation to flame war. <laughs> Should we rebase? I'm sorry if not everybody sees that because it's at the, bo at the bottom of the screen. Uh, just in case not everybody knows what I'm talking about. What's rebasing? OK, so we have our master. And I cloned the master. I started working on it, which are those gray commits. Somebody else did the same. They also cloned, also worked on master, managed to commit their changes and push them uh, to the upstream repository before I could do it. And now I'm trying to push. It says rejected. What now? I have two options. The safer one is to do what actually Git tells me, so merge my changes. So I look what I have done. I look what uh, my colleagues have done and make a normal merge and just commit it to the repository, push it. What I end up with? I end up with something which is safe because no hackery was done in this place. But I end up with a tree which is, well, which is becoming a full graph. So if you look at it in any graphical interface, you see that the tree of your changes is growing vertic uh, well, horizontally. Sorry. <laughs> uh, is it a problem? Yes. Basically, if you have many people committing to the repository, uh, you would not be able to actually track what happened there. So what Git allows us to do is to, the, to do rebase which means I'm pretending that I haven't done my changes starting from this bottom change, but from this top one. So how it looks like. So I basically discard my changes lo locally, and I reapply the diffs, basically, on top of the existing repository, which means two things. My history is vertical. There are no branches, no merges. But the changes that I actually did locally they are no longer valid. These are different changes than the ones that actually end up in the repository. So what I have to make sure is that those local changes are forgotten. I haven't pushed them anywhere. Nobody has pulled from my repository, so nobody has ever seen them. I have to be aware that I'm safe to do rebase. And practice in our team is that rebasing is basically safe. It didn't ever happen, at least I'm not aware of it, that uh, rebase caused problems. In practice, I mean, because in theory it can lead to dupli duplicate uh, change sets, it can lead to merge problems, it can lead to, uh, for example, when you delete something from the code because you don't want it, it may uh, turn, uh, turn out that it's back. So it might be dangerous, but I tell you, you may safely do it. 
Okay, so what's the problem? Stepping on each other's toes. Yeah, this is the topic actually of my presentation. So one person destroying the work of somebody else. We have a busy repository, but we have stable branches. So I have a question. Uh, who would willingly create a branch if they had other choice? Yeah, I told it in a way that suggests that the answer is no. Yes, of course, because creating branches means creating problems. Creating problems with merging, creating problems with deciding what should go to what branch. If you can avoid it, it's better to avoid it. But as I said, we have multiple versions of our software. We have to provide patches, so we don't have a choice. We have to have a stable branch uh, for the release that we did maybe half a year ago. So the difference in code is really big, so we cannot do the um, dark features or whatever you call uh, the practice that you turn off piece of code in existing. In one source, you just logically turn off code. So if you, if you support software that is half a year old, it's practically impossible. Mm. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So what Git tells us is that merging in Git, in Git is so often that it has been made very easy. Yes, but sometimes you don't want changes that were done on one branch that uh, you don't want them on your other branch. For example, you're doing mm, security fix on your 6.1x branch for something that we released half a year ago. And they depend on, uh, they're trying to fix problem in an underlying library that has already been fixed in our master, but not it's in 6.1. So the changes that go to 6.1, they should not go to master because they don't apply anymore. They don't make sense, maybe they break things. So the thing that Git promises, which is an easy applying of the diffs, is not what we want. We want to do it smartly. So this brings up the problem of responsibility for merges. Who is going to do it? And why? And when? So the first question is, when I'm supposed to do the merge, are you done yet? So we have multiple change sets on the branch. Somebody said, oh, I finished coding this one, but I have some doubts. Could you please wait with it? Yeah. So we say, yeah, go merge my changes. So we come into the branch. You say, well, when you're ready, please merge your stuff and exactly, merge my stuff. Which means that there is a problem with assigning responsibility. Who is going to merge it? The practice is that if you're just doing a simple branch, like in subversion, so we have the trunk, we have the 6.1, please merge it one day, it doesn't happen. It's a problem. Or it just happens mechanically. So somebody says, oh, it's time to merge, just let's do it. Things break. <coughs> Excuse me. So what can we do? Uh, please tell me, how many of you have used Subversion heavily? <laughs> me too. And I was very happy with it. So basically what you did is cherry picking, which is the name of take this change on this branch, and do something similar on this main branch, and please do it automatically. So we just nominate the, uh, nominate the change set. We say, I want these changes from this change set on my main branch. Please just do it. Is it wrong? Not really. The problem is that this leads to merge conflicts. Because if I did some change and I don't remember that I already did it, if I do some change in the surrounding code, then the next time the merge is going to happen, the tool may just get lost, basically. So this is the illustration of what I mean by branches, basically. So we have this master branch, which is the mainstream of development. We have this, I called it 6.1 because we are working on 6.1, so it was easier for me. But we have this other branch, which is a stable one, which is supposed to contain less code than the main branch. And I do my changes. The gray ones are, are mine. And I decide that this is OK, but I want this change, not all of it, but the important things that I want on master, I want it on master. So I'm cherry picking. 
Oh, this is somebody else working. <laughs> uh, I say to Git that please reapply this single change set to master and nothing else. So for Git later, or basically any tool that I am aware of, this is as if I did the change myself again just on the different branch. It doesn't know that it's actually the same change set as, uh, as on the 6.1 branch. So what happens now? We see this exclamation mark. This is the change done by somebody else, which was not merged to master. I don't know if I can merge it. I don't know if I cannot merge it, because it's not my code. It's written by somebody who is eight hours away from me, so I cannot even ask. And I'm in hurry. I just want to get done with it. So I apply the cherry pick and hope for the best. So I hope that the person who is going to merge the uh, top of the 6.1 branch will do the work for me, basically. So what can I do to make the life easier in such case? I, I did the cherry pick. For example, now I'm a different person. I'm cleaning it up. Uh, one technique that we do is we review the changes from this gray one and older and say, OK, I think that the top of master is all right. It's the way that it should go. So I create a dummy commit, dummy merge, that would just say to Git that, hey, you have merged this whole subtree already. Don't do it again. Because doing the, uh, applying the diff again is the source of this merge conflict. So the answer, uh, sorry, one bullet too, too fast. Uh, how to do it? You can use git merge minus, uh, sorry, minus s hours, which means I'm on a branch, master. I know I'm fine. Please resolve everything to look exactly like it was on my branch. It just means I have merged the other one manually. I know what, what I'm doing. There's another one which says uh, dash s is the strategy, uh, dares. Sometimes I want to change the name of the branch practically, which is not allowed by, uh, for example, GitHub in normal mm, configuration on any, or any other tool. So I want all the changes from one branch to be actually now on master. So I had some had branch something, I called it uh, my new 6.2, and I want now it to be master. So I can use similar thing to not cheat Git in any way, but just say that, OK, from now on, the changes on master are supposed to be exactly what is on 6.2 branch, and just let's get over it. OK, the answer to the cherry picking problem is the feature branches, or called topic branches, maybe. It depends who is talking. <laughs> we call it feature branches. What is it about? We come back to the situation that we started. So we have this 6.1 branch, we have the master, and we want to be resilient to any changes on 6.1 or on master that, is, that are not ours. We don't want to care about those changes. So what we can do? We branch from the common denominator, so the stuff, uh, sorry, the, the um, change set that is a base both for the 6.1 and the master. It doesn't necessarily have to be the place where the 6.1 was branched off. I'll talk about it later. It's some change, which is, uh, ch some change set which is common to both, ma uh, both uh, branches. I do my work. I commit often, because it's important to commit often, because then I control my work. It's easier to merge. Uh, it's easier to, re to review, which, is, which uh, is something that I'm going to talk later about. And I can decide whether I want to push this feature branch upstream or not. Uh, in Jira, it depends. If it's something small, it's, if it's something tactical, I don't create an official branch for it. It's just in my local repository. If it's something that more than one person is going to work on, we just create a normal branch in the upstream repository. We use Bitbucket, by the way. Mm. OK, so the work continues on the 6.1 branch, which I don't care about. And I say, OK, I'm done. It's time to merge my changes both to the 6.1 and to the master. So what I do is I switch to 6.1. I say, merge my feature branch, which probably applies cleanly, because Git has the uh, history information in, in its data. 
I switch to master, I say, okay, now merge my feature branch. So you can see that in no way master has to depend on this question mark because it's just in a different branch. It's in a different part of the graph because we should always think about change set in Git as a graph. Well, it doesn't have cycles, that's one thing. But other than that, it's just a graph. So, for example, if somebody likes to draw planar graph, graphs, Git is just heaven for them. Okay, how do we know which chain set is the root for our branch, where we should start? This is another tool that Git gives us. So be aware that there is Git merge base, which is, not, which is a command, which doesn't do what you think it does. So if you have multiple stable branches, you should use this one, show branch, dash dash, merge base. And the development can continue from this place. So we are not uh, fixed to branching again. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we are not fixed to, uh, to branching again from the base of our uh, branch. We can continue from the last sensible point. This is what the show, uh, uh, merge base actually tells you, which chance that is the one that you should start working from. Okay. What can we do if we want to mm, push our changes and we are not sure that we haven't screwed up our repository? Use a local staging repository. So don't push upstream. Create your own local upstream. And push there. See if it's good. If it's good, push forward. And use branch builds. So branch build is a setting on your continuous integration server, which doesn't build only master or only trunk or whatever, but also builds your important feature branches and builds your uh, stable branches. It really saves your life. And what can we do if we want to change the same code as somebody else is doing? I promise I'll be faster now. <laughs> uh, you can log the code if you can. So you just say, please don't touch it. I'm working on it. But usually you cannot. You can create a long living development branch, which means, OK, I want to have some peace. I want to have my own branch, and I'll just do my stuff there and pretend that nobody is doing anything else. And Git gives us the hope of clean merge, but it's a false hope. Because if you do it, yes, it will merge, but probably you will introduce things that you didn't want to introduce. And the question is, who is the owner of the code? because you want to ask forgiveness for breaking somebody or messing with somebody's code, or ask permission to do it. And I wouldn't want to be kicked out of the Agile conference by saying that code has owner, because we have the collective code ownership principle. But this applies that you should treat every code as your own, so you are not afraid to touch it. You should refactor it when you can. You should take care of it. But it doesn't mean that really there is no owner, because the owner is the one responsible. At least I understand it this way. So for example, you may have cross-product component, and somebody just knows what's important there, knows the schedule, knows how to tell other products that the change is supposed to go. So just, just you need to ask them, or at least tell them. Or somebody is just developing the stuff. So this, the developers all over the world, in our company at least, are the colleagues. You just don't want to make their life miserable. Just if they are actively developing something, maybe you may wait with your changes. And sometimes you have some piece of alien technology that nobody understands. And you have impractical deployment. For example, for on-demand things, you have to deploy to the actual production servers or some special testing. So then it's better just to consult the person who knows what it, is, what it is all about. And I want to stress out the difference between code ownership and product ownership. Because yes, there is something like collective code ownership. I can go and change any code because I'm allowed to. I'm actually encouraged to. But the product is something that's owned by product owners or the product managers. So I cannot just change some feature because I think it's a good idea. I have to ask people who are responsible for it. So. I did my changes, so I'm creating the code review. Basically, we always do code review, and we almost always treat it as a peer review, which means I'm asking people 
uh, who ask me the same questions. There is no special authority that I have to ask for approval or some special people who just are appointed to be code reviewers. I just present my changes to the code so that I can, first of all, validate the, the design. Did I do the right thing, in your opinion? Uh, seek advice. Can I do it better? Is it how you would do it? And first of all, to tell people that I did change. So when they come back to the code, they are not surprised. And sometimes I go to conferences, I learn about new libraries, new coding techniques, and I just want to show off and convince everybody that it's the way to go. Everybody should go functional, by the way. Sometimes if I create a feature branch which really changes how the product looks like, I need approval for this branch. So I'm not merging right away because I'm done. Sometimes I need to wait for other people to say, OK, we are ready for your change. And we use internal pull requests for that. I don't know, how many of you know what the pull request is? OK. Uh, so basically, pull request means that I'm asking, uh, I'm not committing changes directly to the repository. I am mm, committing to the clone, and I'm asking the owner of the original repository, please review my changes and decide if you want them or not. And if you do, just merge them. And when I do code review, basically when the change is already there. So if I commit to the same repository, either if it's a single change set or a separate branch, and it's safe to leave the changes in the repository. Because if I'm doing security fix that is not announced, I cannot do it in an open source repository, for example, because of many policies. And I believe that the change is mature and ready to merge. Because if it's not mature, I have doubts. I just don't do code review, unless for just asking advice. Uh, probably would uh, do pull request. And as I said, I expect approval. So I'm done with my changes. I think I, it's OK. Just please have a look. And the important thing, it should be clear who is going to merge, whether it's going to be me when you say that the review is fine, or it's going to be you, or there is, uh, there is some process that just defines it. And when would I do the pull request? First of all, from practice, when the change is not urgent because I can wait weeks until people finally do the change I ask, because I don't force them. I haven't put the code into the repository yet, so it's safe. You can wait. Or it's high risk, or a change that uh, I'm not sure that should actually get into this repository, because it's dangerous. Maybe it just uh, shows some security issues that I don't want to show yet. And often I do pull requests just to show what I did, because it's a separate repository, it's easy to discard. So I do spike in a separate repository, then create pull requests for people to look at it. When it's 80% done, which means not done, so it has to be tested, validated. But I say here, have a look, maybe you like it. The same with solution proposal. Have a look, would you do it this way? Maybe, please. And definitely, I expect it to be rejected, because if I didn't expect it to be rejected, I would just commit it to the final repository and be done. What can I do with the feedback from the code review? First of all, I can acknowledge, yeah, I know I should use final, and ignore it. So the next time I'm doing some similar change, I will use this final that you're asking me, or just continue doing it my way. And I can create iterative review. So I'm creating a review, you suggest some changes. Then I re-implement the stuff that I have, ask you again about the review. Do you like it now? No, not yet. Again, again, finally we come to conclusion, we close the review. And sometimes we just have a technical debt. What is a technical debt? In a positive sense. It's explicitly tracked and explicitly prioritized change that has to be done or just ignored, because not every change is necessary. If I have a potential NPE in some strange corner case, it just doesn't matter. Let it just blow up. We have more important things to do. Do you have any questions? Anybody? So, no hands? One hand. Excuse me. I have a question. Um, we use a version now. 
Mm -hmm. You said you were using it. <coughs> What's your opinion? Would you suggest moving to Git? Definitely. So <laughs> one thing is that you have to read a bit about Git. And definitely, you have to have somebody who knows Git. I mean, you don't have PhD in Git. But you have to have a champion, which makes the transition much easier. And then definitely, yes, switch from subversion to Git. Because how I, how I personally switched to Git, I used the SVN to Git bridge to manage my SVN repositories, because it was much easier to merge branches this way. So yes. Any other questions? If no, then. <laughs> so thank you very much. And we say a big thanks for you. Thank you. Oh, and please grab me later if you want to talk about the, the subject. I love it. So after a short break, we will have a Zuzi on the stage. <laughs> <laughs>